We are excited even this weekend, even as we conclude the uh, conference. And uh, I think so many of us are just so filled with what God is speaking to us directly. And it is my prayer that as we continue to just listen to the Holy Spirit, I believe God will just be amazingly doing things in our midst. So don't forget the 2017 special, we call it, right, which end all right, this uh, weekend. Uh, so that you will sign up at a really, really special price. So check that out because it ends uh, this afternoon. And uh, so we, I also want to welcome again those uh, who are delegates here, uh, especially many of you, you know, are new to some of our people who just come for the celebration. And so I want to welcome you one more time, uh, the pastors and, and delegates uh, from different uh, places. And we are so honoured to have you here. But I would like to just specially uh, mention once again yesterday uh, evening, I welcome especially our Cambodian pastors, nine of them, okay? And so, Tum Reapsu, welcome. They are all our pastors, all right, in uh, Cambodia. Amen. So many of us, we have prayed for them, but we never really seen them face to face except those who have gone on a mission trip. And as many of them actually, uh, more than half of them actually are first time coming out of the country and they got their passport the day, just in time, the day before they're flying out of Cambodia. So I told them I'm so glad uh, to see them uh, face to face as well. And so we also want to welcome, I'm not sure whether they've been, our, our missionary Annette, are you here yesterday? You were not here, so I'm not sure, but I want to welcome our Annette and also our, and, uh, our mission partners from Nepal and Myanmar. They are also here, so we are really uh, glad to have them. Are they here They're from Myanmar and Nepal? Are you here? No, not here today, okay? But we, have, we still want to welcome them because it is a great privilege of connecting with some of these people that we see on our mission trips. Uh. And uh, so I want to just once again remind all of us that, you know, we are going through the series of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I think God is speaking many things into our lives to recognize that as we move much with what the Word of God has instructed us to do, in our mind, we process them, but in the spirit, that's when the power of God begins to show Himself. So I, we believe that as we continue to do that, I reminded all of us that this river is flowing. This river of revival of our hearts are flowing. Let's all jump into it. And none better than, you know, today's, this morning's speaker, uh, Pastor Joey Bonifacio. And before that, of course, uh, Joseph Bonifacio, the son that we have heard yesterday. is amazing. I thought I saw him there earlier on. He's somewhere, all right? Where are you? Oh, you're yeah, over there, okay? Together with Carla and uh, young son Philip. We're so glad to have them to speak to us about young people. And they, my heart is so stirred as a result of hearing what he has to say. But of course, Pastor Joey, uh, one of the things I gleaned from him is that that is a great discipleship church. In the midst of all the thousands of people, 80,000 in Metro Manila meeting in 15 locations. Can you imagine 100 over services that happen okay, at the same time during the weekend? That speaks something about the discipleship culture that they have. But more than that, I believe it is a work of the Holy Spirit in their midst. Uh. And of course, not forgetting our brothers in Sydney Mohidi and together with the team, thank you very much all right, for just serving us in this way. All right. So let's put our hands together and welcome Pastor Joey Bonifacio. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray for Pastor Joey. Let's stretch our hands. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our dear brother here. We want to pray that as he continue to speak forth your word, Father, we pray for a greater manifestation of your Holy Spirit, God, upon our hearing, upon our seeing, so that in all this, Lord, we will begin to, Lord, put something into our hearts that will allow us uh, to be different from the time we come in, God. So we pray all this, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Morning. Before I get into the Word, I do want to express my deep and heartfelt thank you to all of you for having me and my son and his wife and my grandson, Philip. Uh, we have enjoyed your hospitality, your... Uh, awesome Malaysian food, amen? And finally, the finale yesterday was the meal that I had was so good, I had to ask the head waiter for the calling card, so the next time I am back in KL, and somebody asked me where to eat, I'm going to say the exact restaurant I was in last night. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I'd like to do a quick introduction about my family. For those of you who were not at the conference, this is my wife of 34 years, soon to be. 
uh, and uh, the most beautiful woman in the universe. Amen. Uh, and uh, it's been a joy to be with her. This is my son, Joseph, who's with us, literally my favorite first son in the universe. And this is his wife, Carla, and my grandson, Philip. I uh, was watching them after all the meals last night. We were having dessert together. And I was watching just the interface between the three of them. And I felt a different sort of joy that I've never had before, that I'm now experiencing as a, as a grandfather and watching my son become a father and watching uh, this family blossom. And it's, a, it's just a joy to, to have them with me in this trip. My youngest son, uh, Joshua, is a realtor, and his wife, Christy, and inside that picture is actually a baby that has actually been born, but this is a rather old picture. And the third guy over there is my second son, which is, happens to be my favorite second son in the universe. He's not married in this picture, but about less than a month ago, he did get married, and she's not in the picture there with us. And the, 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 the last member of our family is our dog, Vito. Uh, the current, uh, my current uh, bedside mate who sleeps with me at night, uh, interestingly. I was told that you should not brag about your sons, but you can brag about your grandchildren. And so let me just brag about my grandson, Philip. That's the second baby that was not in the picture earlier, who was born uh, less than a month ago. And Philip, our, our, our two-year-old grandson, was a little bit of a protege or a prodigy of a, of a child. When he was born, he was born a genius. So we asked him, we tried it out and said, Philip, can you do math? And this was right after infancy. I mean, this is incredible. He said, Philip, do you know one plus one? And he responded by saying this. <laughs> we, we were so blown away by the, by the genius of this child that we decided we were gonna up the ante and said, Philip, do you know the square root of four? And we just wanted to know if this child was really who he was meant to be, and he responded by saying this. <laughs> and so we thought, maybe he's a math brain, but what about languages? What about English? So we said, Philip, do you know the first letter of our church? And he said this. <laughs> and that's a little bit of my bragging rights as a grandfather. As you can tell, I'm new at the business. And in speaking of that, I was watching my grandson, Philip, try to get up on stage while Sydney and the team were worshiping and reminded me of prophetically, interestingly, of my message to you this morning. My message to you this morning is entitled The Rule Breakers. I want to talk about rule breaking, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the men in history who are very popular at rule breaking. Douglas MacArthur was caught saying, you are remembered for the rules you break. Pablo Picasso said, learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. Albert Einstein broke a lot of the laws of physics. And more recently, Steve Jobs changed our world by breaking a lot of rules. The rule breakers. There's two very important reasons why these men are very successful. It's not because of the rule breaking. It's because they understood which rules needed to be broken. You see, there's some rules that need to be broken because they're really not foundational, rasting rules, but they're tentative rules that are made by men that are really not the basis for future things that are to happen. That's the reason why these men succeeded. But as successful as they are in breaking rules that need to be broken, these men became great rule breakers because of the depth of the understanding of the foundations that they have knowing that certain rules should not and cannot be broken. Great men can break rules because they understand that certain rules need to be broken, and there are other rules that can never, everybody say never, never be broken. Case in point, my second son, David, is an artist, and he was learning, he's a businessman now, but he was a, he's all like to, like to paint a lot, and so we got an art teacher for him, who was a very good art teacher. And for weeks, this art teacher just taught him to, David, just draw squares, boxes, triangles, and lines, and shade them. 
And week after week, hour after hour after hour, and multiple hours, he was told, just draw lines, draw squares, draw boxes, draw triangles, and keep doing it. Until finally, after weeks of this, he got so fed up, he went to his art teacher and says, I'm going to tell my parents to fire you. Because they're, you know, he's, 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 he's my son, amen? I mean, my, my, he, he's got my character. He's that, he's that type of person. And he said, because he's, they're paying you a lot, but all you do is teach me how to draw lines. And the artist, the kind of man that he was, sat him down and said, David, if you really want to get good at painting, you need to be good at drawing lines, boxes, triangles, and circles, because all art is a combination of those things. And when you master those foundations, you can pretty much create anything else there is. Because there are certain things that are foundational. There are rules that cannot and never can be broken. And there are rules that you need to trash because they're dead and they're useless. The greatest master rule breaker is actually the man Jesus Christ. The Pharisees hated him because he kept breaking their rules. Multiple times they were offended by him because he broke the rules and their traditions which rightfully should be broken because of the power of the Holy Spirit inside of him. At the beginning point of his ministry, when he rose out of the waters of baptism, the Bible says the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Now we all know that Jesus is deity. He is God. And yet the Holy Spirit was necessary for him to move in the power to be able to break the rules that needed to be broken and to be able to keep the rules that needed to be kept. In his own words, Jesus said, I do not, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but rather to fulfill them. In other words, there are rules, guys, that I'm not here to break. I'm breaking the rules that you've turned into rules that shouldn't be rules. But you've turned them into life-killing rules rather than the law. And I've not come to kill the law. I've actually come to bring it to life, to make you understand it in its fullness. Hence, I want to talk to you today about the fundamentals and the depths and the review of the laws of God that cannot be broken in light of rules that we as church leaders, members, practitioners, keep putting on ourselves that shouldn't be the rules that we should be keeping. The rule I'm talking about is in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. The rule, the primary rule that Jesus said, you cannot break. It's Ten Commandments. He said, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The Jews were slaves. All they knew and understood was a heart of being a slave. Moses brought them out of Egypt. And in Egypt, there were multiple gods, hundreds of gods, and they had no idea of how God would work in their lives. And so here is Moses taking them out of the promised land and saying there's certain foundational commands that you cannot break. You can, you can dispense of all kinds of rules and laws, but these ten commandments you can't. And the first of these is to know that there is one God. Not multiple gods, there's one God. And you're supposed to have no other gods before him. They're no longer are gone are the days where you have all these multiple different deities. There's only one. And you need to know him. And he said, this is the rule. You shall have no other gods before me. No other gods before me. Beside me, before me, under me, I am, I am one God. And he began to speak this. And Jesus is saying, this is the fulfillment of why I've come, to let you know that these rules cannot be broken. Further, he said in Exodus 20, verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a, a, a carved image. You're probably telling yourselves, well, we don't do that, pastor. I mean, we're Christians. And the first rule really is this, God cannot be made. You can't make your own God. You can't invent your God. You can't determine how you want God to play. He's got rules. He's got infinite opportunities, infinite capacities, and he wants to give you those. 
but he wants to make sure you understand he's not the God you created out of your own imagination, but you understand who he is. Because you and I cannot carve a God. We can't shape a God. We can't form a God. We can't say, this is how I understand God. There is a God. And that's why Philip's genius is such a genius, because one plus one equals two. Amen? You can't say one plus one equals three. It's one plus one equals two. If they say God says there's one God, how many gods are there? One. There's only one God. Egypt had hundreds of gods, shaped out of stone, out of rock, out of brick, out of precious material, out of metal, and they shaped them, and they made people bow down to them. They were deceitful gods. They were gods that lied to them. Hence, they became slaves of these gods, because they weren't gods that loved them. They were gods that wanted to enslave them. And see here we find in Deuteronomy 32, verse 17, they sacrifice to demons. By the way, when you sacrifice or pray to other gods, literally, you are praying to demons. That's what they are. Because there, are, there is no other god, and there are no other gods. If there are other gods that you propose to be worshiping or are putting your hope and trust in, you are literally speaking and playing to the hands of demons, the Bible says. This is not a very pretty message this morning, amen? But it will set you free. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons. They poured out innocent blood of their sons and daughters, and they sacrificed the idols of Cana. In other words, these are demons. Idols are demons. I like the story of Tony Chan. If you haven't heard about his story, it's an interesting story. This man is a billionaire. He's a billionaire because of Feng Shui. He's a master Feng Shui teacher. And he makes billions because he does Feng Shui to the richest of the richest in Hong Kong. Interestingly, he had a driver. The driver was filled with the Holy Spirit, amen? <laughs> and began to share the gospel with him. And slowly but surely, this Feng Shui billionaire master got reached by not another billionaire, a driver. Because when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, there's a power that transcends human abilities and human capacities that only God can do. The story of Tony Chan is best read in this article. It says, Hong Kong's Tony Chan Chun, a Feng Shui master, has renounced the Chinese system of geomancy. He went public as devilish and became a Christian after reading the Bible and was baptized this week and changed his name to Peter Chan. Thank God they didn't say Peter Pan. <laughs> Chan was baptized by Pastor Lim Yik Lok Lok at the Crossroad Community Baptist Church in Sing Yi Island, Hong Kong on Tuesday, Sound of China, China Morning Post. This, this was huge news. This is the happiest day in my life. I felt like getting married. I could tell everyone that I'm a Christian, he was quoted saying during the private baptism. Attended by about 70 friends and relatives, including his wife, Tai Tam Miu Ching. You know, it's interesting. It was not just the baptism. What wife said, testified that she has been changed. She has seen changes in him in his conver conversion. He has changed from becoming a quieter. How I many of you know the Holy Spirit can make you quiet? Amen. Happier. Less agitated, she was quoted as saying, we are more harmonious now as he's spending more time with kids. The Holy Spirit des deserves a round of applause for that story. <laughs> the story doesn't end there. Chan recently told a gathering of Christians that his, this, his past was complete crap and has to be flushed away. Feng Shui is an ancient Chinese belief system based on harnessing natural and spiritual energies, he said, is fake. It's demonic. Only Christ is true. If Feng Shui turns out to be true, it is only the devil playing tricks. Some of you came here this morning to hear this story. You have to be especially careful if they come true because they're creating such effects. The devil's motives is to lure people towards him, the standard quoted him saying. Chan told Commercial Radio this week that his life began to change in March last year when his driver, everybody say, driver! So if you're saying God can't use me, 
it's probably not because he can't use you. It's probably because you're too self-centered to be used by God. His driver, Harry Tam, quit and, uh, uh, quiet, uh, and gave him a Bible. When I held onto that Bible, I felt like paralyzed and warm in my heart. So I asked Henry, can I have a meeting with the pastor, he said. There he is, being baptized. And I believe that as he rose out of those waters, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. You cannot make God. God cannot be made. You cannot choose and decide, this feels good for me. Hence, I'm going to do it this way. This is the kind of God I want. I want him packaged in this way. I want him doing this way things for me. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. He is God. He is Lord. The third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, attempted to make his own God. He actually took the Bible and he said, I don't agree with the God of the Bible. And he began to cut portions of the Bible and created what is today known in history in museums as the Thomas Jefferson Bible. The Bible that is devoid of power and miracles and just the principles of the kingdom. Some of you in this room are like that. I like the principles. I don't quite like the, the, the mysticism. I don't quite like, listen, you want the principles. You want the power. You want everything because he is God. When he tells you to go to church, you go to church. When he tells you to tithe, you tithe. When he tells you to pray, you pray. Amen? Pastor, I'm getting three amens here. There's some rules you can break, folks. Like the kind of wafer you eat at communion. Like whether you jump or shout for music. There's some rules you're not going to break. You shall have no other gods before me. You cannot carve me and shape me. You shall not bow down to them and serve them. God cannot be made. God cannot be replaced. Some of you in this room, you take God and say, I want you, God, as long as you bless me, as long as you take care of my family, as long as you provide for my business, as long as I get my Mercedes-Benz polished, and there's nothing wrong with a Mercedes-Benz, amen? Nothing wrong with it. I actually love the car. I don't have one. I wish I had. It's just that you don't live for those things. You can't bow down. You can't replace God with these. These are idols. Whenever you replace God with something, whatever they may be, you're replacing them with idols. That's the problem of the Pharisees. The Pharisees replaced God with laws and rules. And that's why Jesus said, you can't do that. The laws do not take the place of God. The laws are all about, the laws are there to reveal God. Imagine walking into a dark room. You wanted to use a restroom. And somebody said you could use this room and you enter this restroom and you could smell the stench and you could smell how awful the room smelled. And yet you can't see anything because it's so dark. And then finally you switch the lights on and this is what you see. It explains why the room smells. That's the law. The law is like the light bulb that switches on the place, not for you to worship the law, but for you to know that your life so stinks, you need God. That was the mistake of the Pharisees. The Pharisees thought that by keeping the law and obeying God and doing the religious duty, by going to church, by attending small group, which by the way is not a bad thing, by doing all my little rules, I'm going to be fine. And God said, no, I don't need you for 90 minutes in a church and 90 minutes once a week in a small group. I need you 24 hours a day. You shall have no other gods before me. The law is merely there to remind you you can't make this work without me. That's all it is for. And so the law dims us when we try to live out the law. And then it reminds us again how sick we are. Because it's all there to make us draw near to God. And say, God, I really, really can't make this life work without you. 
The problem that the Pharisees had was they started worshiping the light bulb. <laughs> How stupid is that? They started worshiping the law rather than loving the God who kept showing them can't live this life without me. Can't make this life work without me. And so Jesus came and said, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to fulfill them. Because it's not thou shalt not murder. It's thou shalt not murder. You shall not murder. It's not you shall not murder. It's you shall not murder because of me. I've come to fulfill it. It's not you shall not steal. You will never steal because of me. Because when my spirit goes into your heart, and you understand that the laws cannot be fulfilled by just keeping the laws. You live a life of power. Now, you can keep switching that on and off. Jesus said to the Pharisees, here's your problem, boys. You keep reading your Bibles because you think in these rules you will find eternal life. Yet, you don't realize that the whole point of these rules and these laws is to talk about me. By the way, I'm not by any chance telling you not to read your Bibles. I actually believe you should read your Bibles every day. Because when you read your Bibles every day, you're going to be spoken to by the Holy Spirit every day, and you're going to get to learn more about who Jesus is. The Bible, as great as it is, can become an idol. I know everything about the Bible. I know and I could quote the Bible. The Bible is not about the Bible. The Bible is about God. <laughs> it's about Jesus. And here's the problem sometimes with Christians. We can turn good things into idols that were not meant to be idols. My stage of life right now, 59 years old, been walking with the Lord now for close to 33 years. I don't have a lot of idols. But when I check my heart, I probably have one big one. It's this one. It's not a bad thing to love your family. But I'm here to tell you that there, even your family cannot go before God. My oldest son, Joseph, is here, and you probably saw him. He's got a thing in his head. My all-time favorite oldest son in the universe. In August 8, 2005, I was watching a movie and I received a phone call and I was told that he had had an accident. Got to the hospital and I found my son, don't mean to be graphic, I just want you to catch the spirit of what I'm saying. I watched my son lying down in the gurney, throwing up blood, fighting for life. It was a moment that I had to spend time with God, waiting outside the operating room for hours, wondering if I was going to receive a vegetable or a dead body. I couldn't help my wife, who was drowning in pain, couldn't help my children. I could only go before God. I wish I could tell you that I said initially, Lord, have your way and your will, but that wasn't it. I said, Lord, why? I've given you everything. And I remember the sweet, the silent, the powerful voice of the Holy Spirit. You shall have no other gods before me. That's what it was about Abraham. And if you're going to prosper, if you're going to be the person that God created you to be, you're going to have to learn this one rule, this one rule, this most basic rule, that the Holy Spirit will keep reminding you, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make your own idea of who God is. You 
cannot carve your own thoughts of who God is. God is God. Thankfully, Joseph survived. Swathed in bandage, he came to the room. And apparently, when you have brain surgery, traumatic brain surgery, the first thing they do is they ask you to wiggle your toes and wiggle your fingers. So we were all watching there. He could wiggle. So he was wiggling his toes and wiggling his fingers. And then the doctor said, can you say the ABC forwards, backwards, count 1 to 20, forwards, backwards. He did all of that. And finally, the doctor explained to him what happened and said, do you remember what happened? So uh, we put a plate in your, in your skull to hold your fragmented skull together. And so Joseph woke up and said, oh, does that mean I'm going to have a better signal on my cell phone from this day forward? <laughs> and that's when we realized he was healed, amen? Yeah. Verse 5, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. It's a funny word, this word jealousy. Because little do people understand that God cannot be made, God cannot be replaced, and God's laws are always, 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 never about the rules, but always about God's love. Jealousy is a strong word. It's a strong, powerful word. It's a weird word. It's like fear. You know, there's an aspect of the fear that the Bible says, you shall not have fear, and yet the Bible says, you shall fear the Lord because there's an ungodly fear and there's a godly fear. And same with jealousy. There's an ungodly jealousy. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 3 says, For you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, you are still of the flesh. There's an ungodly form of jealousy. Romans chapter 13, 13 says, Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy. Interesting, isn't it? Quarreling and jealousy is right along the same sins as orgies and drunkenness. Do you get jealous? Do you get envious of other people? It's ungodly. It's right along the same level as immorality and sensuality. There's an ungodly form of jealousy, and yet the Apostle Paul says there's a godly jealousy. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, I'm jealous with you for you with a godly jealousy. Interesting. This word jealousy is powerful because there's a side of it that's extremely ungodly, and yet that's why you can't just do rules, folks. Because God's not after rules and behavior. He's after the heart because if the heart gets fixed, the behavior follows. Godly jealousy. Jealousy is so embedded in us. And here's my proof. Even little children have it. Jealousy is love and anger at the same time. I love you because I love you because you're special to me. I love you because you're exclusive to me. That's why I'm jealous. Whether it's ungodly jealousy or godly jealousy, both of them involve love and anger. For good reason. If you were in love with somebody, there's a level of exclusivity, a priority. You're saying, you're my priority. I'm jealous if you are taking priorities elsewhere. I remember my second son, after he got married, a week later, I called him up and said, Dave, how's things? Great, Pop. You see, my, my second son is a workaholic. So he listens to podcasts. He throws me a lot of books. Pop, read this. Pop, read that. Pop, I'm going to put this thing in your, pod, in your phone so you can listen to this idea. So he keeps throwing me all this business stuff. He's a business, businessman. And so he finally gets married. And, he's, and whenever he goes to the inside of the car, he has a podcast. He's listening to business stuff. And so finally now he's married and a girl rides his car. And he plays his podcast in this, this brand new, he married a British woman she, who's a believer. She looks at him and says, David, from now on, you're not listening to podcasts in this car. How many of you know she's now demanding priority? There's a jealousy that comes with that. And for you golfers, your wife can get jealous over that. Not saying you shouldn't play golf. Just don't put golf ahead of your wife. And all the women said, 
<laughs> there is such a thing as a priority. Nothing wrong with working hard. Nothing wrong with ministry. Just make sure you find your priorities right because that's what love and anger is. People get angry because you're supposed to be my priority. When you start prioritizing someone else or something else, you're going to get me angry. Not because I'm angry, but because I love you. Because I want to give you all I have. I want you to be my priority. Which, In which case, if you don't do the same thing to me, obviously I'm going to get angry. Love and anger because we expect fidelity. Fidelity is nothing more than loyalty that gets stronger over time. When you say, I love you, I love you with a loyalty that does not wane, that does not get weaker as you grow older, it actually gets stronger because I love you more because I've invested more in you and you've invested so much more in me and so there's fidelity. In which case, when that fidelity is challenged, there's jealousy, there's anger. And then there's the expectation of intimacy. I love you. I don't want you to be intimate with someone else. I want to be intimate with you. And I want you intimate with me. And it's the fundamental difference between godly jealousy and ungodly jealousy. You've all heard of the jealous lover who killed her lover because of love and anger. Herein lies the big difference between godly jealousy and God's jealousy. And godly jealousy is insecure. It doesn't have the security of God to know that he has control. It knows that it has no control over his lover or her lover, in which case I might as well kill him or lose him or get rid of him because anyway he's going to kill me with jealousy. It's always insecure, always demands a payback. You need to pay me for the infraction that you did to me. Most of all, at some point, it wants you dead. God's jealousy is different. Secure. It doesn't demand payback. It, it's okay. I forgive you. But most of all, the reason why he loves you it's not because he wants you dead. It's because he wants you back. It's what we sang about. Mercy and power never ending. All throughout eternity, I want you back. I'm jealous for you. Stop this nonsense. Don't put any other gods before me. Don't try to create a God that I'm not. In my country, as I close, there was a recent incident of a party, huge rave party, and they were passing around drugs during this party, and there were teenagers. By dawn of the next morning, five of those teenagers were dead. The drugs that they passed around contained lethal elements. It was big news. I think it actually made CNN. When they checked the autopsies, the drugs that were passed around, apparently from the Netherlands, killed these kids. Reminded me of Joseph's accident. And I was grateful to God I didn't lose him. But my heart went out to the parents that lost their kids. And I can guarantee you that each of those parents, in their heart of hearts, were probably crying and saying, gosh, I wish you didn't go out that night. I wish you just stayed home in the place of security with me. I can guarantee you all those parents are not saying, you stupid nincompoop of a child. They're all saying, you don't have to do anything. I just want you back. That's jealous love. 
That's the love that Jesus was bringing to the people. That's the love he was saying, guys, you're messed up. You got it wrong. This is not about rules. This is not about things to do. This is not about going to church. You got it wrong. This is not about tithing. This is about you knowing this love so very much deep down in your core that you're willing to break the wrong rules and keep the few ones, the few really, that you shouldn't break. You should have no other gods before me. Don't try to reinvent me and try to shape me in the way you want to. Don't you dare try to put an idol before me. But instead, understand, I'm jealous for you. I want you to make me your priority every day. Because I have made you my priority every day. I want to hang out with you, Joey. I want to take walks with you. I want to show you things that you probably have never ever understood or even knew even existed. I'm jealous for you. I love you. As I close, the essence of this commandment is summarized in this verse. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. You know, people read that and say, you know, God's going to judge the generations because you didn't serve. You know what that verse actually means? I'm so jealous for you that even though you're sinners, I'm going to still visit you. Up to the third and fourth generation, even though you're unfaithful to me. Because I want to show you loving kindness. I want to get you to the place that you understand what this commandment's all about. Because the command is really not about rules. It's about you understanding this jealous, this steadfast, this unwavering, immovable love that I have for you. So I can bless you. So you can live in holiness and not for feng shui, really? For a doll, for a car, for a business. I want to give you more than that. One kiss from God will make you so joyful. He'll meet every fulfillment and expectation you have, but you're too busy to even to receive it. And so he makes it into a law. And he reminds us, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make and carve and shape you. You shall not bow down to anybody other than me. So that you will one day experience my steadfast love. The rules of God were not meant to be rules. They were all about his love. Amen. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you. Reboko pasakati balakatiya lamataya, shaboko bora papakaya. Thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for this morning. Ki reboko to bokaya la masante le moko rabashi, rebokata makata la bakia la lamataya. Praise you, God. Praise you, Father. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Holy Spirit, O oh God. I'm asking you, Father, as lead 2016 ends. And real life starts once again. Touch your people to the core, Holy Spirit, O oh God. Move, reveal, bring discoveries and revelations about who you are. Could you look up here for a minute? Sometimes we look for the same revelation. You know, God has a revelation. I like what Pastor Jeffrey Rachmat said to us during the conference. The key that opens every door, big or small, is small. <laughs> All keys are small. But I like the second point he made. As, as all keys are, your keys are not my keys. The keys for me are not the keys for you. And you do not learn to be personal with the Holy Spirit because He's personal with you. That's what intimacy is. Intimacy is personal. 
I know exactly the kind of tickle that my wife likes and the kind of tickle that she hates. I know exactly the words that she enjoys and the words that she hates. That's the Holy Spirit with you. He wants to be intimate. He wants to call you by name. The most joyful thing I have each day when I wake up is I hear the Holy Spirit say to me, Joey, I love you. <laughs> it makes me laugh that the God of the universe steps into my room and says, Joey, I love you. That's right. And I begin to prioritize him with my day. Sure, Lord. I wanted to go to my son's room. I wanted to wake them up and have breakfast with them. And the Holy Spirit said, no, no, you and I are having breakfast today. You and I, Joey, are having breakfast today. And I did. And I stepped down, walked into the breakfast place, and there was Pastor Gary with a message for me from the Holy Spirit. Be led by Him. Prioritize Him. Have no other gods before Him. Be intimate with Him. Depend on Him. Let Him teach you. Let Him guide you. Let him provide for you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen and Amen. Church, it's time we respond. Amen. I think if the Holy Spirit has spoken into our hearts, and I believe there are the message of just the intimacy with God, and that can only come when we desire. I believe God, I just sense the Lord is saying that He's going to put a desire in you. A desire in you to say, Lord, I want to be intimate with you. I want Holy Spirit for you, Lord, to bring that love of God into my heart because it's a supernatural thing. It's not natural in that sense. But only God can draw us to Him. And I think we need to desire Him. Desire what Pastor Joey is talking about, the intimacy that we need to cultivate. And I believe this is the same message the Lord has been saying the last few weekends. It's the Holy Spirit that will bring that intimacy into your life. You know, as Pastor Joey was speaking just now, the Lord brought that verse into my mind that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. And do you know why he's, He can be grieved? Because He watches us all the time. And sometimes we grieve Him because we exclude Him from our lives. So I sense that this morning, the Lord wants us to desire Him. And if that's your heart's desire, and sometimes it helps when we physically take it a point to just respond. And the best way to do it, I believe, is to say, if your heart desires so, I want you to stand with me right now. Right? The Lord would not, you know, condemn anyone to say that if you're standing or not standing. It's about a respond to Him. And say, Lord, I do want in my heart right now, Lord, to desire You. Because that pleases God. That pleases God in our hearts. If you're not a Christian this morning, you've heard that message. Maybe you've come to church for many times now. If you're not a Christian, maybe you're backslided away from God, maybe. I think it's a great time right now to just say, Jesus, I need you. Can you do that right now? If you're not a Christian, you may be a backslider away from God. In your heart right now, you say a simple prayer to God. It's not a complicated prayer. In your heart right now, you say, Jesus, I need you. That's a simple prayer. I need you in my life. I need you to come and do something new in my heart. And if you say that prayer in your heart, I believe God comes into your life. You can thank Him for that. Renew your heart, renew your mind, even right now. Thank you, Lord. Father, you hear our prayers. You know the condition of our hearts. Holy Spirit, will you right now, Lord, reveal to us the condition of our hearts, that as we desire you, God, Father, will you open up our hearts so that we know that we have created space, God, in our hearts for you. And all the things that doesn't honor you, Lord, 
that has become God's in our life. Father, we surrender that to you. We surrender that to you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And I sense that there's the anointing of just the Lord, the Holy Spirit, just wanting to bless us. And I want to open up this time in the front here. If not a Christian, if a friend has brought you, if you brought a friend, maybe, just ask your friend, can I walk up to the front with you? You know, just introduce Jesus to you. And those of you who need an empowering of the Holy Spirit, again, there's a call we've been making for many weeks now, whether you need to be baptized in the Spirit, whether you need to receive that prayer tongues into your life. I want to open up this altar right now, especially for those who say that I need more of the Holy Spirit. All right. So I just said this is the first call that if that's what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, respond. Don't leave this place without that divine exchange we've got and there'll be our leaders who can pray for you. Let's sing this song and, and just the Spirit leads. Do not wait. Just come straight to the front and then I'm going to make a second call. I just sense God is saying a few things into our congregation right now. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I sing forever. Thank you, Lord. I sing forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. If the Spirit is prompting, just forever. step forward. And I think it's important to just I obey that prompting forever. in our hearts. Thank you, Lord. Some of you are sensing the Holy Spirit just prompting you right now. Some of you are maybe in tears. Some of you are just sensing the Holy Spirit and just touching you in one way that you know. And let, let's not be interrupted by what's happening in the front, but you, just you and the Lord right now, wherever you're standing, up in the gallery as well. Do not let that distance you know, prevent you from coming down. But if that's what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, respond to Him. It is important to do that because God works through seasons. And sometimes we miss out the seasons in our life. We can actually miss out on the blessings of God. And I believe this conference here have reminded many of us to learn to walk right before Him. Learn to walk in the Spirit of God. I sense that as I was praying just now, the word is treasure. The Lord is saying that you are my treasure. You are always my treasure. And the Lord has given you a key. A key that unlocks the treasure God has put into your life and often it is us preventing ourselves from opening that door in a sense God is saying to you do not be afraid to open that treasure in your life do not be afraid and one of the things that you know God continue to remind us to take that responsibility and to say Lord I need you I need you and this is a great time all right in the church here even this morning that the Lord is saying that to you respond do not walk away you know, when the Lord has already put that into our hearts. If you, do not fear. Do not be afraid because we are a family. Amen? We are a family of God. We want to pray with you because you have the same Holy Spirit in you. And we're going to open this time as well for anyone who needs healing in your life. 
Anyone who needs to make a decision in your life, I sense as though there are broken, many broken relationships that you know in your own life. Marriages, if these things are not right in your life, maybe children, we are reminded, can be idols in our life. Maybe you need to come out and say, Lord, I need to learn to surrender my children. Maybe you come up as parents who say, maybe my children has become an idol in my life. So whatever needs that you have, I believe the Holy Spirit knows and the Holy Spirit is going to help you in your life. So one last time, I'm going to sing this. I'm going to close in a short while. So do not miss what God is doing in your life. Thank you, Lord. You are beside me, always there to lead. I will not be shaken. I put my trust in you. Jesus, you're amazing. Glory is everlasting. I will sing forever. God, you are beside me, always said to me, I will not be shaken, I put my trust in you, cause Jesus, you're amazing, glorious everlasting, I will sing forever, Lord, there is none, God, you are God, you are beside me, always there to lead me. I will not be shaken. I put my trust in you. I put my trust in you. Jesus, your amazing, glorious everlasting. I will sing forever. No, there is none. Declare it. Thank you, Lord. And you may not be up here, but I believe that, you know, in the weeks that have gone past, the Lord has given many of us prayer tongues. And I want to continue to encourage you to pray in that prayer tongues. And so I want you right now to do that right now for yourself, all right? Because sometimes we do not know what we ought to pray. We pray in the Spirit just to allow God to do something in our life, to strengthen, to edify us in our spirit. I hope you are doing that 10 minutes a day and just praying in the Spirit because I believe that will build you up to be strong. So I want to encourage you to do that. Even right now, maybe you've not done it. All right, right now, standing where you are, just pray in the Spirit right now. Pray because the Lord knows what kind of prayers that need to come out from your life. Let's raise our voices together. Imba humba hada na da shiko pa hakira da bada kina da bada kina da ba. Imba hana da bada kino pa hana da siko imba hana di do pa kina da bada da bada da ba. Imba humba hana da bada di shuko imba hana da bada hino. Imba hana da bada di de shika da ba. Just pray or sing in the spirit right now. Imba humba hana da do do kumba hino ba hino. Imbahada da se kumba hero bari umba. Indohida se kumbolo.
singing because he's singing from the heart he's singing from your spirit so open your mouth just sing to the lord You are my treasure, my children. You are my great treasure. Do you know how, how much treasure that are in you? You are so precious that I will send my son, my only son, to die for you. Do you know how precious that is to me that I will lay down my life, Jesus said. I will lay down my life for you. And I love you. And I have a great plan for your life. Do not stand in the back. Stand in the front. Because I've given you the authority as a child of God that I died for. Take that authority wherever you go, whether at home, whether in your offices, whether in your university or schools that you go to. Stand in that authority that I've given to you as a child of God. And never, never let go of my hand. Because my hand, my strong hand holds your hand. I'm far, I am far larger than all the issues of your life. I am far bigger than every issue of your life. And the Heavenly Father, as your Heavenly Father, I stand in the front with you. And no matter what you face in your life, I am always there for you. Thank you, Lord. Father, we receive that word, God. Yes, Lord, we receive that word from you. And so, God, even as we leave this place, we go holding the hand of a heavenly father, the strong hand of our father. And when, we, when that hand, God, is there, we know we have that confidence in you, Lord. So God, as we go out into the mission field, God, the mission field that you have prepared for us, Father, teach us, God, to hear your Holy Spirit so that you would direct us, God, what to do and what to say. Lead us to people, Lord, that we can be a blessing to. And so, Lord, will you bless, God, the works of our hands so that it will produce much fruit. And so now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of His Spirit be with us both now and forevermore and all God's children say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great weekend ahead of you. And don't forget to sign up for the early bird for the conference. <laughs>